Hello. The Wild Fur Shippers Council, jointly with North American Fur Auctions, is proud to present this video that is intended to help you prepare your fox and coyote pelts adequately for the international fur markets. In this production, you will see each step, from the capture of the animal to the end use by the fur manufacturers and retailers. I hope you find this video entertaining, interesting, but most importantly, that it helps you get the maximum price for each of your pelts. My name is Serge Larivière. I wish you good luck on the trapline. Red fox and coyote are by far the two canids most frequently harvested by wild fur producers. These two species are abundant over much of the continent, and they are accessible to trappers from southern United States to northern Canada. The handling of foxes and coyotes is similar, and it is mainly these two species that will be discussed in this video. Obtaining the maximum value of the fur starts before the trapper even begins trapping. Indeed, the main determinant of the value of the fur will be the season in which it is harvested. The trapper may be an expert in fur handling, give it all the care possible, but if the animal harvested does not have a fully prime pelt, the value of this fur will be affected without any mistake by the trapper. It is important to harvest animals when the quality of the fur is at its peak. This is the most important point that affects the value of the pelt. Now it's very important to be able to catch the foxes on the right season. Fox and coyotes are harvested in a variety of ways, either by foothold traps, snares, or by hunting. Regardless of the method of capture, it is important to minimize damage to the pelt. Foothold traps must be visited often, and the capture animals should be euthanized in a way that minimizes damage to the pelt. Trappers using snares should aim to capture the animal by the neck, as close to the ears as possible, whether using live holding cables or whether using killing snares. The fur on the neck is stronger and denser and more resistant to damage. In addition, should there be any damage on the upper end of the pelt, it will not prevent the use of the full pelt. On the other hand, a visible snare mark in the middle of the back or near the hip will almost always reduce the value of the pelt. The trapper should also be careful not to pull fur or cut guard hairs while removing the snare. Use wire cutting pliers and cut on the ventral side to avoid damaging the more valuable fur on the back of the neck. Fox and coyote hunters will use calibers that minimize damage to the fur. When possible, the entry and exit holes of the bullet will be as small as possible. When using shotguns, the animal should be harvested at an adequate distance to ensure a quick death, while minimizing the aggregation of pellets in order to spread the small holes on the skin. When successful, the hunter should take steps to prevent blood from staining the entire pelt. Also, freshly killed animals will be positioned in a way that prevents staining fur of other harvested animals. It is recommended to skin animals as soon as possible. In canids, the ventral region heats up quickly and spoilage appears with tainting of the belly, often referred to as green belly. Therefore, it is important to skin the animals as soon as possible after harvest. If you are short on time, skin the animals immediately and freeze the pelts. Pelts can be left frozen for a month or two without any problems, and then thawed out before fleshing. If the animal is infected with sarcoptic mange, don't skin it. The fur has no commercial value. An animal infected with ticks can be treated by putting it into a plastic bag and spraying insecticide. Close the bag for 10 minutes, and this will kill ticks and other external parasites. We can now start skinning. The skinning of foxes and coyotes is similar. Trapper Serge La Riviere from Quebec, Canada explains how to properly skin a red fox. The first step when skinning a fox is to protect your hands. So you have to use latex gloves or surgical gloves. There are several kinds available, 
Use whatever kind you like best. Surgical gloves not only protect your hands from diseases, but they also improve the hygiene, you know. So, before I start skinning, I'm going to make sure I remove everything that may have been left in the fur, like this snare, for example. Also, look for debris in the fur and brush it or do a quick inspection. A little brushing helps, but it'll be more important before we flesh and board the fox. So now I'm ready to start skinning my fox, but one, one trick that was given to me by a trapper is to get a little more grip when you're trying to pull the skin is cover your surgical gloves with a, a really cheap or very thin wool glove. And uh, that little, that's going to give you a lot more grip when you're pulling on the skin. Uh, might keep your hands warmer if you're in a cold skinning shed, but for sure it gives you better grip when you're pulling down on the slippery parts. And uh, you'll see later on, I'm going to use that also as a, as a paper towel lots of times. So, so now I'm ready to start skinning. Uh, first step is, uh, we're not going to use the fur from the front legs, so I'm going to use this, uh, this really sharp uh, knife here to cut just a few inches, uh, maybe even an inch down from the elbow and cut all the way around the front leg. That fur of the front leg is not going to be used, so uh, there's no, no point in leaving it on the carcass or on the, on the pelt. So I'll do both front legs that way, cut around, and uh, that's going to save me a lot of work later on when I'm skinning, as you'll see. Once that cut is made now, I'm ready to make my first initial, initial cut. On a red fox, it's fairly simple. I'll use a, a small triangular knife. I really like those, uh, those small triangular knives, the various brands, doesn't really matter. And I'll, um, I'll poke that knife right down at the base of the back foot, follow the edge of the white and the red fur. So, uh, or it can be gray in this case, but follow the edge between the, the two different fur colors, if you will, and cut from one heel all the way to the other. If your knife is sharp, you should be able to do that in one, uh, one cut. Then you'll see a, a nice uh, split, and then you'll have access to the flesh underneath. At this point, I'm going to use my fingers, and uh, and I'll pull the meat from the skin using my fingers. I typically start with the leg that's hanging first, and uh, it's very simple, very uh, very easy to do that. I'll slide my fingers, and then pull the, the the meat from the the skin, and then by folding the back leg like this, I'm able to pull the skin around and free the first back leg. You'll see uh, during this uh, video, I use uh, three different knives really for skinning. The, uh, the sharp knife for the front legs, the triangular knife for the opening cut, and I what I call a multi-purpose knife to do everything else because I want to keep my, my sharp knives sharp. So I've freed the first back leg, then I'm going to go and pull on the second back leg and free the fur from that one as well using the same process. Again, cut at the base of the heel. No point to skin all the way to the toes. And then I'm going to hang the second back leg on the gambrel. Once that's done, I'm going to use my hands, pull evenly on each side of the tail. Clear the anus and basically try to work my way to the base of the tailbone. Sometimes you need to cut there, sometimes you don't. Uh, every animal is different. But usually with your gloves, you get good grip, you're able to go there. If it's tough, you can use your sharpening steel. That's a, you'll see there's a lot of use for the sharpening steel. And you can use the sharpening steel, not only to sharpen your knives, but also as a, as a tool to free the tough parts. Here, for example, I'll use the sharpening steel to just pull on the leather and free the tailbone, at least the first inches of the tailbone. So that's going to give me a little space to put my tail stripper in and remove the tailbone. Sometimes you may need to cut a little bit around the base of the tailbone to free the, but sometimes not. So the main thing is you need a good tail stripper. You position it around the tailbone and you just squeeze a little bit and then you pull downwards. You're not trying to squeeze the tailbone. You're just trying to use the tool to pull the tail fur from the tailbone. So I'm going to pull down and lift the tailbone at the same time. And once it starts to move, it's really easy. So now the tailbone is removed. That's really important. If you leave the tailbone in the tail, that fur is going to, is going to, it's not going to dry properly. It eventually will fall off the pelt. So now right at the base of the back there, there's sometimes a little uh, saddle and you cut that. And then you work with your glove 
uh, with your gloved hand basically pulling the, the skin down slowly and evenly uh, and that should pull really easy all the way to the front legs. Steady pressure is the key. Now you can see I'm at the front legs now. And once I get there, I'll use my sharpening steel again. Stick it in between, basically in the armpit of the fox. And I'm gonna, simply going to pull down. And that's going to pull the, the skin away from the front leg. And a little pulling and now the front leg is free. As you can see now, that first cut did a really nice job. It's a nice even cut and uh, saves me a bit of work at the during the skinning so it's really easy to free the front legs that way once that's done now i'm at the neck i'm going to be a little careful i know this fox was caught in a snare and sometimes the leather may be a little weaker because of the of the catch so i'm going to work carefully make sure i don't rip the pelt and i'm going to pull down slowly uh, foxes have small necks and big heads so it's always a little tough sometimes you need to cut a little bit to uh, make that part easier. So I'll cut around the neck slowly and then keep pulling. And I should uh, soon uh, go over the, the biggest part of the head and we'll see the ear cartilage come up. You notice now I use my gloves as, as almost as paper towels, you know? So I want to see exactly where I'm, what I'm doing, where I need to cut. So having those, uh, those wool gloves really make that uh, real handy. Now I'm going to use my sharpening steel again to pull the ears the same way I pull the front legs. I'm going to st stick the sharpening steel in between the skull and the ear cartilage. And uh, basically by pulling down after that, it's going to free the ear from the ear cartilage. So the fur stays on the pelt and the cartilage stays on the carcass. And that's what I want. In one easy step, I've removed all the cartilage from the ear. So I'm going to do the second ear the same way. So again, in between. And as you see, when I'm pulling downwards, the fur comes free from the cartilage. So this is a real nice uh, trick for trappers. Saves a lot of work, makes that job very easy. So the ears are done and it looks better that way. Now, if I was going to do a full mount, I would maybe not do it like this, but uh, for commercial pelt use, that's what I want to do. So now I've got left is use, uh, use the knife to uh, skin down to the eyes. Now the eyes of all fur bears are all done the same way. You cut slowly until you see the beginning of the eyes show up and then you should see a, a darker spot and then you keep your knife perpendicular to the skull and you cut slowly and that frees the, uh, the eye fur, if you will, from the skull. And so you have uh, all the fur stays on the pelt. Now, as soon as we're done with the eyes, we'll see the corners of the mouth. And on a fox, there's a big lower jaw, and we're not going to use that skin. So what we want to do is remove that, that skin from the pelt. When they uh, receive it at the auction house, that's where they'll attach the barcode. They'll staple it in the mouth, so that, uh, that fur from the lower jaw is, is useless. And it's also something that can catch it and rip during the drumming process or handling process. So I simply caught the fur from the lower jaw. That's what I did here. And now all I've got left to do is skin the, the, whatever's left of the bridge of the nose all the way to the tip and remo removing the cartilage from the tip of the nose. So once that's done, then uh, the skinning part is complete. So I have on the, uh, on the fur all the parts. Uh, the tail is still on, the ears are on, the cartilage has been removed. Uh, the head is skinned all the way to the tip and I have a complete uh, fox pelt. Ready now for the next steps, which will be uh, fleshing and boarding. So there you go. My fox is, is ready for the next step. A coyote can be skinned like a fox, but since the animal is bigger and the fur is more difficult to remove, there are some differences. There are two ways to do the front legs. One can be like with foxes and cut all around, or cut the legs with a hatchet. The initial cut is the same. Coyote fur is more difficult to remove, so it will require more cutting than with a fox. The tailbone is removed in the same way as with the fox. Once the base of the back is cleared, the fur can be pulled down using a winch. 
The dorsal fur is attached with either a large diameter rope or by placing a golf ball in the fur and wrapping the rope around it. The use of sawdust or wood shavings will increase traction and prevent the ball or rope from slipping off. This provides a strong anchor to help pull down the skin. The winch is used to lower the fur slowly, cutting when necessary. As we did when skinning foxes, using a sharpening steel and a long screwdriver will help clear the front legs. If the legs are difficult to remove, to make the task easier, you can cut a little with your knife or use a hammer to separate skin from flesh. The winch can be used up to the ears. Coyote ears can also be done using a sharpening steel. However, to facilitate this operation, the inner cartilage of the ear must sometimes be cut. The eyes and mouth are skinned, like with the fox, by cutting slowly at the junction between the skin and the flesh. The lower lip is removed and the cutting continues until the skin is completely detached from the carcass. Most of your fox and coyote pelts will need to be fleshed before the drying process. In fact, the fat that remains on the leather will cause tainting, and this will eventually result in hair loss. Now we're showing you a damaged skin. We call it a taint. That will go to damage. We just don't know how far that's going to go, so we're going to put it damaged. It is therefore essential to remove the excess fat and flesh left on the leather. When we're at the stage of fleshing or removing the fat, it's a good idea to brush the pelt again. Make sure there's no burrs, no dry blood or anything left in the fur that could snag while you're going to flesh it. So you check the skin again, making sure it's free of debris. Then you'll turn it inside out and pull the, basically pull the skin inside out so the fat is exposed. And the foxes are all different. Uh, this one is really fat, as you can see. It's going to require more work. Some foxes are very lean and require very little fleshing. In fact, some foxes you don't even have to use a fleshing beam for. But this one is, as you can see, has a lot of fat, so it's going to take a little bit of scraping. Now, before I start, if I haven't done so already, I'll make sure to remove the cartilage from the nose. Uh, sometimes when you're skinning in the field, you do it quick, and sometimes the cartilage will stay on, but when you get to the first shed, if you haven't done so already, you need to remove the... Uh, the cartilage from the nose. And then at the base of the tail, depending on how you skin your fox, I've usually I, I leave uh, the skin around the, uh, the vent and I'm not going to use that, so I'll remove it at this point. Then the last thing I'll do before I start fleshing is split the tail. So uh, there's many ways to do this. What I like to use is to use a little tool like this that's uh, going to allow me to split the leather from the tail and cut it open so it can dry properly. So that'll be the main thing. Once that's done, then I'm ready to start fleshing. I like to use a triangular uh, fleshing knife or scraper, if you will, to start pushing uh, the, fur, the fat from the top of the head down around the ears, remove the last bit of cartilage around the ears and push on the neck and shoulders down. I don't use a very sharp knife, I use a triangular knife that's more of a scraper than a flesher, it doesn't cut, it just pushes the fat off. And I'm going to work my way from the top of the neck and basically scrape until I can see the leather. Now if there's a snare mark like there is on this fox, I'll be extra cautious around that, but I'll keep fleshing and pushing the fat down as I go. This um, fleshing or scraper, like I said, is not sharp. It's just meant to scrape the fat off the, the skin. There's many different tools, and uh, once you find one you like, use that one. What's important is uh, you try it, then you'll know right away if it's the right tool for the job. So basically, push the fat down, and once you pass the front legs, you can use the front legs to hook the skin and keep pushing. On the belly side of the fox, you have to be really careful because there's some areas that are really fragile and sometimes the pelt will tend to rip there if you're not cautious. So you can use pressure downward and scrape the fur off. The fat on a fox is really dry, dry fat. It's not, it's not soft, it's hard and dry. 
and it pulls, uh, exerts a lot of pressure on the leather. So, so you have to be careful. And uh, once in a while, you can even pull some of that fat off with your, uh, with your hands, so it shows you a little better what's left. This fox is unusually fat, so there's a lot of fleshing to be done to get it to, uh, to the point where I can board it. Leather is fragile on a fox, and as you get near the, uh, the, be the, the end of the belly there, around the genital area, you have to be really cautious. The skin is really thin, the leather is, is fragile, and, and the fat is dry and, and really sticky. So it's stuck there, so you have to, to scrape very carefully. So gentle strokes downward and remove the fat from the scraping tool when there's too much. And then you turn the, the pelt a little bit at a time while removing the bands of, of fat. You'll see right away when, the, when you get to the leather side. And we don't over scrape a fox, but what you want to do is remove all the visible fat. As you see, I use my gloves to clean my, my scraping tool. That's what I said. I really like using uh, those, uh, those uh, wool gloves on top of my surgical gloves, just because it allows, allows me to clean my knife and uh, work better. Now, if, if the fat is really stuck there, sometimes I can spray a little sawdust on the, uh, on the fat, and that's going to allow the scraper to bite a little more in the fat, so it's going to get better grip and that's going to also help remove the fat from some tough areas. So I do a final check again on the genital part there. It's fragile, so I have to go real easy. It's really easy to, to tear one of those foxes. The leather on a fox is really, really thin. They dry real fast, but the downside is when you scrape. Now you see I put a little too much pressure on the back, and now I've made a little hole. That, that'll have to be repaired for sure, but... That shows how fragile these foxes are, and you know when you're you're trying to scrape. Sometimes it happens, and over time you you get some tricks, and sometimes you can't avoid it. And uh, that's why we're going to show you how to repair these skins for for these small damages that you create when you're fleshing. So that's normal. So so there you go. There might be a few uh, pieces of fat left. We'll see when we board it. And as you see, uh, even the experts make mistakes sometimes. If the fur has holes, they must be sewn before boarding. There are many ways to repair the skin, but the important thing is to sew any hole that is larger than a small coin. For canids, wood boards are preferred for the drying process. Indeed, wet leather tends to stick to wire stretchers, which in turn takes longer to dry and may result in tainting on the sides of the pelt. Wooden boards are therefore preferred. These boards can be marked by the sizes used by fur graders which will allow the trapper to know the size category for each of his or her skins. Once the leather is properly fleshed, the trapper can proceed to the first drying step by putting up the pelt, leather outside, on the stretcher. It is important to use the stretchers that fit the natural shape of each species. For foxes, there is only one board size used for all foxes, big or small. For coyotes, there are two recommended board sizes, one for large coyotes and one for small coyotes. Drying should ideally happen in a cool and dry place at a temperature of about 14 degrees Celsius. Fox and coyote pelts are sold with the fur on the outside. To properly dry these pelts, there are two options. The conventional method is to stretch and dry pelts using a two-step process. The first step will be an initial drying of the leather on the outside for a day, then turn the pelt fur side out for the final drying. Some trappers dry their skin in a single operation, boarding the pelt fur side out right from the start. Their wooden boards are modified to allow air circulation, and they are connected to air hoses that force air onto the inside of the pelt for drying. When boarding, it is important to properly center the pelt. Then use a push pin on each side of the tail to hold the lower back, and another push pin at the end of the tail. If the tail has a split along its entire length and the tailbone has been removed, there is no need to pin the tail open. Some trappers like to dry the tails with wire mesh or cardboard, but the most important thing is to remove the tailbone 
split the tail open, and dry it straight for a better presentation. Okay, guys, it's very important to take the bone out of the, the tail. If you don't do it, then the fur will come out. It'll take too long to dry, and that's the problem, what's happening here. On the ventral side, two push pins are fixed at the end of each hind leg. So we can board a fox using only seven push pins, two on each hind leg, two at the base of the back, and one at the end of the tail. In comparison, a coyote will require between seven and 11 push pins, two or three on each hind leg, two to four on the back, and one at the end of the tail. During the drying process, the trapper may wipe off any oil that forms on the leather. If the pelt is hanging with the head pointing down, the oil will drip to the ground and will not stain the fur. If the pelt is dried with the head up, it will be important to regularly wipe the excess oil during the process. To find out if the drying process or the first step of the drying process is, is, is finished, the leather side should be dry to the touch. So as I'm touching it here, it shouldn't be sticky, it should be all dry, and if it is, I'm ready to turn it over. So of course, first step, I'm going to remove the push pins that I use to hold the, the skin in place. And uh, at the same time, I can verify the belly area or the base of the tail. It's all dry. So once the push pins are removed, I'm going to slide the pelt off the board. And uh, I'm going to proceed to turning it over. So. The, uh, the first place I'm going to turn is the ears. I'm going to push the, uh, the ear fur back inside and then go on with the nose like this. Turn the nose and then push it in. I'm going to work from the mouth all the way to the, to the base of the tail. And one thing I'm not going to turn over is the front legs. I'm going to leave the front legs the way they are because uh, once the pelt is turned, that means the front legs or the tubes from the front legs will be inside and uh, you'll see why when we uh, board the pelt. So again, the uh, leather is dry, I'm still able to move it. I go slow, I watch the, uh, the belly area, and if I need a little help, I may want to hang the nose on a, on a hook at the ceiling or on a nail, strong nail, and I'll flip the, the, the pelt. Be careful around the belly, it's always more fragile that way, or that location is. And I'm gonna slide it back on the same board and uh, slide the pelt, position it again, Center the nose and then make sure the front legs are positioned, pro positioned properly. So I'm going to push him in and uh, position the nose carefully. Once that's done, I'm going to use a few push pins just to hold the back legs in place so they don't, they don't dry sticking out. And no need to put any push pins at the base of the, of the back there. And one thing I like to do to improve the appearance of the pelt is pull the ear fur forward and pin it down. And that clears the fur from the, from the neck and that's really where the graders look and uh, for density. So, uh, so I wanna make sure I clear that. It looks better. Uh, it doesn't change the price, it just improves the appearance. Then I'm gonna give it a good brushing. You know, again, make sure the furs all looks good. And as you see, as I'm brushing the belly, the fur brush is not gonna hook on the front legs. It's all smooth the, because the front legs are inside. So there's really nothing to, to hook. So I know in the handling at the auction house, there's no, no risk of anything catching during the drumming process, no lower lip or no front legs that could catch and rip the skin. So the fur is good. So now I'm just gonna leave it there for a few more days. After a few days on the board, the, the pelt should now be completely dry. So I'm gonna remove the, the push pins. So there should be two on the ears and two on the back legs. Now I'm going to pull it from the stretcher and I'll see right away if it's dry enough. If it's dry, the nose should keep its shape and it should be completely dry. This is typically the part that dries last. So if the mouth and, and nose is dry, then you know the pelt is dry. It's going to keep its shape. That's important. Now there might be a little moisture left, so what I'm going to do is this hang the spelt by the nose up to a ceiling hook and let it dry there for just a few more days. And then it's funny, it's finished and ready to be shipped to the auction. For shipping, pelts will be placed in the bags provided by the auction house and handed over to the NAFA agent during fur pickup. The bags of fur will then be shipped to the auction house.
When pelts arrive at the auction house, staff will open the fur bags and begin labeling each skin with a barcode, which is fixed to the nose part with an industrial stapler. This barcode will allow the tracking of each pelt throughout the entire auction process, from grading to final shipment to the buyer. Once received and labeled with a barcode, and before proceeding to the grading, fox and coyote pelts will be sent for drumming. This step enhances the luster and volume of the fur on the pelts that often have been stored for several days in shipping bags. Drumming also removes dirt, bloodstains, and other debris that may remain in the fur. In addition to improve the overall look of each pelt, drumming allows graders to do a better job. All fox and coyote pelts are drummed before the grading process. A lot of trappers think that a fox is a fox, but you'll see when we start degrading, they're not all the same. In nature, the red fox is only one species, but it comes into three different color phases, the red fox, the cross fox, and the silver fox. In the international fur markets, these three color phases are considered separately. By far, the most widespread and abundant is the red fox. Its grading is therefore more elaborate. Once out of the drum, red fox pelts are separated by color. Red foxes have several shades of color, from cherry red to pale yellow. In general, the eastern fox is darker than the western fox, and the latter usually sell at lower prices. The separation of colors is done with a moving belt on which the pelts are positioned and then move in front of a team of graders. Above the pelts are a series of skins, typical of each of the color grades. There are five color grades for red fox skins. Very dark, dark medium, pale, and extra pale. Note that ventral color does not matter in foxes. For us, they got no difference for the color of the belly. Grading can now begin. The first step in grading is to separate the pelts according to their size. There are two sizes, small and medium, less than 28 inches in length, and large, extra large, more than 28 inches. The small pelts will be classified later, but the large and extra large pelts are separated immediately according to their section. When grading red fox, there are four sections. The first one is heavy, very heavy density. The second, we call it semi. The under fur is just a little bit shorter than the heavy. And the flat one, the under fur is very short and flat. We could feel the table. And we got one, it's called very flat. We got that south of the States. The grading of actual fur quality is then performed for each section. For the red fox, there are a total of nine quality grades, five grades for skins in good condition, and four grades for damaged skins. The grades for skins in good condition are select, first, first and second, second, and second rub. The most beautiful pelts are graded as select. Now we're looking at the uh, quality differ. This is uh, very nice, no damage, uh, very silky, good density, and all, everything is done the right way, so we'll call it select. At this point, the grader will recognize several types of damages. He will immediately assign the skin to one of the four categories of damaged skins. Slight damage good, slight damage poor, third, and fourth. For silver and cross foxes, the grading consists of three main stages, size, quality, and color. Because there is a smaller number of skins, there are fewer grading categories. Graders will sometimes have to combine odd color skins to create lots of sufficient quantity. For Arctic foxes, the grading is based on density, color, and clarity. There are no category of size for them. The grading of gray foxes is done in the same way. Wild fur grader Dave Buick explains. Gray fox are handled exactly the same as a red fox. Feed in, ears, ears done properly, boarded properly, scraped properly. Yeah, it's, very, it's, it's the same as a red fox. In general, 
Gray foxes from the east are bigger, darker, and worth more money. This is an eastern gray fox. It's a little darker, a little more orange. This is a, a western gray fox. You can see it's a lot, little more silvery, a little paler, and not as much orange. As with other foxes, the belly color is not considered. After drumming, coyote furs are separated into three categories, westerns, easterns, and flats. In general, western coyotes are lighter in color and more silky than eastern coyotes, which are generally darker and coarser. Coyotes classified as flat have low fur density and usually come from the southern United States. Once this first grading is done, each category is classified into two sections. For the western coyotes, these two sections will be heavy and semi-heavy, while for the eastern coyotes, these sections will be called north, equivalent to heavy for western coyotes, and north central, equivalent to semi-heavy for western coyotes. For western coyotes, the grader Darcy Lachance explains. Let's say we make two sections. We make a heavy coyote, which has long nap and long guard hair, and we make a semi-coyote which has shorter guard hair and shorter nap. Once separated into sections, the grader examines the belly and back fur for quality and damage. He also notes the size. For western coyotes, there are two sizes, large and extra large, 36 inches or more, and small, medium, less than 36 inches. During this step, damaged skins are also removed to be graded later. Right now I'm grading western semi-coyotes and the first thing I look at on the coyote is a belly. I'm checking for damages only and then I will flip it over and I will give it a snap and check the back for damages and also for fur quality. This one here it's very well covered. The neck and shoulders are very well covered and again the bottom of the coyote is very well covered. This would be a first quality coyote. There are five quality grades. First, first and second good, first and second average, second average, and second poor. For each of these grades, the first part indicates the quality. The other one indicates the coverage, meaning the density of the fur, which is graded as good, average, or poor. Pelts labeled as select are simply the best skins that exist within the grade first. The third step in the grading of coyotes is the evaluation of fur color, which is done in two separate stages. We first separate the back colors into four categories, clear, medium, dark brown, and red or off colors. Because the ventral fur of the western coyotes is also used by manufacturers, this aspect will also be evaluated by the graders. There are three ventral colorations. First and second for white or very pale bellies, clear to off for slightly yellow bellies, and third and fourth for bellies that are yellow or reddish. In summary, the very best skins will have a snow white belly. Furs with damages are classified separately. Since there are five distinct categories for damaged furs, a grader is specifically assigned for this task. The five categories of damages are damage good, average damage, poor damage, third damage, and fourth damage also called no commercial value. About 75% of the damages on a skin occur naturally and exist even before the animal was caught. The most common damages are unprimed fur, burrs, rubs, or damages caused by mange. Here we have a mangy coyote. Characteristics of it are that it will almost be a solid, solid mat. Uh, we put these into no commercial value we would rather not have the people send these in because they are just too difficult to find buyers for. The best mangy coyotes will grade as a third and damage. And that is where we only have about 10 to 15 percent usable fur and it usually has to be of good caliber. The other 25 percent of the damages are caused by the trappers themselves. The most common damage observed is tainting or hair loss due to long delays before skinning of the animal or improper fleshing of the pelt. Is some people maybe uh, don't take enough fat off. And this is a, 
off the pelt. And this is uh, evidenced by the fact that when it dries, it tends to do a little bit of rotting onto the pelt. And then when you're grating it, this is the result. And what that's going to do is damage the pelt. This is even more evident in some like that. This rotted prior to the uh, trapper doing it. Same with this. And similarly that. A lot of that is caused by when you bring the animal in, either having it too warm or having it lay in, a, in a, say, a garage floor, for example, uh, too long. And if it's laying on the belly, for example, the belly's taken a long time to cool off, and that's where the animal tends to start to rot first in those areas. So yeah, just be a little bit more careful with that. So when you get a damaged grade, um, you'll understand it possibly, that's why. Eastern coyotes are graded separately, but the main steps are the same as for Western coyotes. Eastern coyotes are basically graded the same way as Westerns, Western semis. All the coyotes we get are based on coverage and underwool. The better the coverage, the better the underwool, generally better the grade. Um, as you know, Easterns are generally come in a decent size, but they also have different depths of, of guard hair. This one is a longer guard hair, which means it's a heavier nap, like more of a northern nap. This one is a shorter guard hair, which is a shorter nap. This is not as preferred as that, because the shorter the nap in a coyote, the most likely the trim isn't going to go as far, and it's going to have to take a wider strip to make the same type of trim that you'll get out of a northern coyote, which is a shorter strip, or narrower strip. Grading of eastern coyotes differs from western coyotes in three ways. First, because eastern coyotes are larger than western coyotes, additional sizes of double extra large and triple extra large is added for pelts that are more than 42 inches in length. Secondly, there are only two back colors for eastern coyotes, medium and dark. Finally, the belly fur on eastern coyotes is not graded. No, we don't color the bellies of the eastern because generally they're all, 99% of them come like that. When I turn these over without hand picking, you can see that that might be your best color, but there's no hair on the belly, so it really doesn't matter. Where the westerns, it makes sense to split the bellies. Steve Gamblin, senior grader at NAFA, summarizes the grading of eastern coyotes. Um, Easterns, by and large, their value is in size. The bigger they are, the deeper the fur, the better the coverage, the better the value. Uh, this is not the preferred trimmer, obviously, because it's not as soft. So when the collar is around your neck, this is very, very soft, where an Eastern is very, very coarse and spiky. Um, once you get below a certain quality of an Eastern, the value drops considerably. The value Damaged furs will be graded similarly to Western coyotes. Each year, NAFA receives about a thousand red coyotes and a dozen black coyotes. The grading for these skins is simplified and their value is much lower. One of the problems is that the quantity is limited, which reduces the appeal of these skins for buyers. Basically what they are, mutations of coyotes. Uh, no, Lord knows what wild animals do in the wild, but somewhere along the line there was some breeding done that sort of kicked out what you call a weird species of coyote. The value of these red ones is very limited. If it's a very good quality, you could get up to $20 US. If it's a very poor quality, it could be $2 US. Similarly with the black one, if it's a very good quality, you could get $20 and, and again, $2 or $3 for a poor quality. Um, there are people interested in this kind of stuff because it's unique and they will use it for something. But by and large, this is not a commercial entity where it's come, it comes in thousands. It's very, very limited. Once the grading is completed, pelts with the same grade and color will be combined into lots ranging from 50 to 200 pelts. For certain grades, there will be several lots of pelts of identical grading. For every lot, 10 skins will be removed by the grader to make a sample lot. This sample lot will be assigned with the same lot number as the bundle where it came from. 
Sample lots will be displayed for examination and evaluation by the buyers. At NAFA, wild fur auctions take place two to four times per year. Visit the website nafa.ca for upcoming sale dates and ways to ship your wild fur skins. During the auction, each lot is sold separately. The auctioneers present each lot, note the offers, and the highest price offered will be that of the sale. Let's start at, at 120, 120 a bit, 120 a 5, 125, 30, 125, 130, 145, 150, 5, 155, 160, 5, 170, 170 a 5, 175, 180, 150, 185, 185, 190, and 5, 200 a bit, 200 a bit in the back, 210, 210 a bit and 20, and 30, 230 is a bit and 40, and 50, 250, 250 a bit in the center back, and 60 now, 70, 270 is a bit. And 80, 280 bit and 90, 300 is a bit and 10, 310 a bit, 310 my bit and 20, 320 the bit on my right, 320 bit on my right, are you all? And 30 now, 330, and 40, 340 bit on my right, 340, the bit is on my right at 340, are you all done at 340? Thank you. Once the sale is over, the skins in the sample lots will be packed with the rest of the pelts of the same lots and then shipped to the respective buyers. Before being used, the furs must go through a dressing process, which involves several steps. The pelts will be soaked in various solutions to clean and soften the leather. After softening, pelts will be degreased, thinned, stretched, oiled, stretched again, drummed, and brushed. Once dressed, the skins will be ready for use by the various manufacturers. Fox and coyote pelts can be used in many ways. In addition to the traditional full-length coats, furs can also be used to make hats, earmuffs, boots and mittens, or to decorate handbags. In recent years, coyote pelts have increased in value because of the use of coyote fur as trim on winter parkas. The most silky and dense furs are preferred. This fashion trend has now spread worldwide. Mario Bilodeau is a trapper, a fur buyer, and the owner of Bilodeau Canada, a taxidermy and fur manufacturing company based in Normandin, Quebec. For many years, he has observed the market trends towards accessories and trimming. For coyote fur, currently, basically, all the market is for trimming. The strips on parkas, the street that goes around the hood, the wrist. That's why it's very important today to have fur that is cut when fully primed. If a trapper captures a coyote too early, the fur will be too short, the guard's air will not be ready, there won't be any under fur, and we will not have top quality like this. The manufacturing of fur-trimmed parkas includes several steps. To make the fur strip for each trim, coyote pelts are first cut into strips and then assembled to balance the direction of the fur on each side of the collar. These strips are then sewn together and mounted onto the hood of the parkas. The fur of red fox is also used for trimming and garment decorations, as well as for traditional fur coats. The skins of arctic foxes are used primarily for trimming, while those of the gray fox, due to their color, are used mostly for garments. Wild fur is incredibly diverse and is a major asset for NAFA, the largest wild fur auction house in the world. Since our beginning with the Hudson's Bay Company at the start of colonization, many things have changed. However, one thing that will never change is the comfort, warmth, and beauty of a wild fur garment. It is because of you, wild fur producers, that this market still exists, and both NAFA and the North American Wild Fur Shipper Council are proud to be your partners in keeping the wild fur industry alive and thriving.